Hello, my name is Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension, Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to do in today's video is talk about suspension and swing arm lengths, both virtual and real. And you might say, well, what's that got to do with a, a history of car suspension? Well, in chapter one, I cover all of these fundamental technical ideas. Otherwise, it's very hard to understand the significance of some of the suspension systems that are covered later in the book. So let's get straight into it. So what we have here is a very, very simple suspension design. We have arms pivoting from near the middle of the car, connecting to the wheels. So it's a very typical swing arm suspension system. But what's significant is what happens when one of those wheels passes over a bump. So here we are, there's a rock in red, and the wheel was lifted up. But because it's connected directly to that arm, that, that, uh, and that arm is connected directly to that pivot point, then the wheel changes in its angle. It develops a camber, in this case what's called a negative camber, leaning inwards at the top towards the center line of the, uh, of the car. Well, so what you say? Well, when you get that much negative camber happening over a relatively small bump, then you have other issues. And here's an example of a car that was sold with swing arm front suspension, one of only a couple that's ever been sold like that, 1963 Hillman Imp. And here is the front suspension. There is one of the arms, and you can see the pivot points are basically in line. So it's exactly the same uh, as the diagram we saw a moment ago. Now, here's a picture of the car cornering and you can see the camber being adopted by those wheels. Now something else is happening there, something else called jacking, which we'll cover in another video, but you can see that they do have a lot of camber, in this case positive camber. The top of the wheels are leaning outwards, all right? So those sorts of camber changes are not good. So simple swing arm suspension of the sort shown here and in the diagrams is basically never used now on any car. All right, but it has been in the past. And here is a car that was regarded very highly at the time, a 1969 Honda Coupe 7, front wheel drive. And this is the rear suspension, and it used longitudinal leaf springs and swing arms pivoting from the other side of the car. So arms as long as you could actually fit in with the track of the car. So the camber change is less because those arms are longer, but you still have quite a lot of camber change during bump. Hmm, okay. Well, what about getting rid of all this camber change? How can we do that? Well, what we do is we go to a double wishbone system. So you have parallel links, one above the other. These links are parallel. Sometimes, as you'll see in a moment, they're not. And they're pivoted at both the wheel and the body. Now that's different to what we just saw. Now when the wheel goes over a bump, it'll stay vertical. It won't change in its camber. But that's one extreme, no camber change. The other extreme was lots of camber change. And in fact, we usually want a little bit of camber change. Why? Because when the car rolls, we want the wheel to stay as vertical to the road as possible. And if we give it a little bit of negative camber compared to the car as it rolls, then it will stay more vertical to the road. So what happens if we incline one of the upper wishbone links? Now, it's not immediately visually obvious what happens, but if we extend these wishbones, then we reach a virtual point. That's the point around which the suspension is virtually moving. It's exactly as if we had a single swing arm going from this point to the middle of the tire. Now you can see why swing arms are so important to picture because that's going to govern the camber change of the wheel during its movement. And you don't actually have to have a real swing arm, it can be a virtual swing arm, as if it were there. <clears throat> and so here we have, drawn in purple, the virtual swing arm length. So it acts as if it's an actual swing arm pivoting around that point. So you can see it, the wheel's going to have more camber change than the Honda system, which at the, the uh, actual pivot point right over the other side of the car. Uh, but it's going to uh, have a lot less camber change than a much shorter swing arm like we saw in the first slide. So the length of the swing arm, whether it's virtual or whether it's real, determines the camber change that occurs during bump. Now, we can go right back 
to the 1930s, around 1934, General Motors introduced independent front suspension, including the use of double wishbones on basically all of their different cars, all of their different marks. And so what we've got here is we've got the upper wishbone. This is the Buick suspension. We've got the lower wishbone. We can see the upper wishbone is shorter than the lower wishbone. And if we draw lines through the pivot points, we can see that they're actually both angled. And what I've done up here is I've actually drawn those lines in and we can see it's an extremely long virtual swing arm. So there was some camber change during bump, but very, very much less than if the uh, swing arms were really being used and had to be kept within the track. Now, a final uh, slide. We've been talking about swing arms, virtual swing arms, and so on. But the idea, as we saw with wishbones, applies to lots of different suspension types. So here we have a semi-trailing arm as used in, in Datsuns and Nissans of the 60s, BMW, even Mercedes, uh, Rolls-Royce use semi-trailing arms. And when we actually draw in the geometry, the semi-trailing arm has a virtual swing arm as well. Here's the effective swing arm length from there to there with this particular type of semi-arm, semi-trailing arm geometry. Now, if we go over here, we can see that here's the camber change that occurs with two different semi-trailing arm suspensions. Bump, rebound, positive camber, negative camber, and there's two lines drawn here. One's for the E12 BMW semi-trailing rear arms, and the other one's for the E28, the later version. But you can see there is a straight line of camber change over suspension movement because that's the effect of the virtual swing arm. You still get that camber change, which of course you can see on heavily laden, olden BMWs, heavily laden uh, Datsuns, where the, the cars, the, the rear wheels have got that negative camber. So car suspension, 120 years of ride and handling. Look at some of the cars we covered then. Honda Coupe 7, not actually covered in the book, but certainly the BMW is, the Buick is, the independent front suspension, the, the uh, initiation of independent front suspension on those GM cars in the 1930s as a result of Morris Olley's uh, research and development. Swing arm length, virtual swing arm length, both critical to understand if you're going to understand not only the history of suspension, but how suspension works in all cars. Thank you.